Welcome, everybody, to the Scale Up Show. This is your host, Ryan Staley, and I have a very special guest with me today. I have Will Barron, who is back for part two. Will's done a lot of stuff, man, on the, the sales side. He hosts the Salesman Podcast, where he's recorded over a 1,000 of the world's most downloaded sales podcasts, right? He's been around for 10 years in that space, which is phenomenal. Um, and as a result, has created some insanely good habits to be able to do that, create a book, and then grow his business consistently. Will, welcome. Happy to have you on the show, man. I'm I'm glad I survived round one, and I'm looking forward to round two. Yeah, dude. Me too. Uh, you did a great job, so we decided to have you back for round two. So <laughs> that that was the uh, criteria. Uh, we didn't have the red button, push the red button, have you fall through the floor like Doctor Evil style or anything like that, man. So I, I integrated it into your intro about habits, and I think that's a cool thing for us to talk about because I am seeing that has been one of the biggest showstoppers for people implementing AI. I know we talked about your thoughts, habits and prospecting. And at the same time, it sounds like you've done some deep work in terms of understanding high performers in this area, specifically for sales. So let's talk about that, man. Walk us through what you did and essentially like what were insights you got. We'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Cool. So habits specifically, we started, we built an assessment tool about five years ago. Um, I need to update the numbers because about 20,000 people, I've been saying 20,000 people have been go, have gone through it. I've been saying that for years and years. So it might be 30, 40 at this point. But we started off with around 150 hypotheses of what traits high performers may have. We tied um, revenue that being generated, voter attainment, um, and then largest deal size. We tied them to the traits that the people who had the largest of those had, and then we narrowed it down to 18 specific traits, one of which is kind of not unsurprising is habits or habit setting. And I found that we talked about this off there as well. One of the things that I get the all new starters in our program to do is to prospect daily. And that is such a transform. It shouldn't be, but that is such a transformational leap in, in most salespeople's and small business owners and founders if they're doing founder led sales in their performance. Because it eliminates this roller coaster of sales where people are doing okay, so they stop prospecting, and then it mm -hmm. goes to shit for three months. And then they get, then they panic because they've not got enough, you know, for a founder to you know pay the pay the payroll for the next quarter. So they get they get the hustle on, do a bunch of lead generation, um, get comfortable, and then go to shit again. That consistency in prospecting via setting habits and habitualizing the boring stuff that don't want to do right. Nobody wants to do cold outreach. Nobody wants to do content creation. If you're doing inbound marketing, inbound led sales, nobody wants to do cold calls. Very few. There might be some, a few psychopaths out there that like doing cold calling on a, you know, on a Monday morning, uh, but very few salespeople, small business owners, founders enjoy doing those activities, but you have to do them routinely, systematically every day to build that habit. And then it becomes like brushing your teeth where it's an activity which is neutral, right? I don't enjoy mm -hmm. it. I don't not enjoy it. It just happens. And that's when you get then a real foundational level of performance from a salesperson, from a you know, founder doing founder-led sales. And it also makes you, allows you to become forecastable, which if you've got a sales leader looking over your shoulder, that's the one thing that they want. So they might be somewhat lenient if you're a little bit behind quota if you're trending in the right direction. But if you're somewhat behind quota and you're all over the place, They've got no time for that because it makes them look like an idiot because they can't forecast up the food chain either. So that setting habits, sticking to the, or making the boring stuff habitualized. So we do it every day. That's absolutely it's really boring, not sexy. We might talk about AI in a second. And this is like the, the antithesis of that, but equally <laughs> as important for, for high performance. Yeah, man. I mean, like, so we'll... Before I ask too much deeper on prospecting, let's talk about the traits, right? Or the 20,000, probably 30,000 people that have been through this of, of high performers. So what are the top five like high performer traits through all those folks going through that, that, that you saw? Cool. So there are 18 in total that we're settled on. Uh, and we're always, we're not doing it in a few months actually, but we're always typically trying to test new, new ideas. So I'm, I'm happy for it to be 45 traits eventually. But 18 um, traits right now, one of the big ones is assertiveness. High performers are assertive in their communication. Um, to add some clarity to that, it's I'll send you the proposal tomorrow if you book in a quick meeting with me tomorrow afternoon so we can run through it, rather than give, 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 give hope for something back later on in the sales process. 
So you've got passive, which is give, 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 assertive, an exchange of value. Then you've got, you know, there's choice words we can use to our soul is the word I use typically on the far end where you're just aggressive. You're just bullying people and it might work with someone who's timid at first, but then they're just going to ghost you. They're never going to speak to you again and you're going to lose mm-hmm. a deal on the back of that. So in the middle, being assertive, exchanging value, you might give, you know, a couple of free consulting sessions and ask for something back at the end, uh, ask for something in return after the couple of them. It doesn't have to be black and white one for one. Um, but that assertiveness is really important. Being comfortable talking about money was a big one as well that I hadn't considered. It was one of the team that suggested we should test for that. If you're uncomfortable talking about large deal sizes, you're going to make everyone else uncomfortable as you're talking about it. It's, it's obvious in hindsight when you when you when you paint a picture like that. But lots of salespeople, if you you know, very few ultra rich individuals or even high net worth individuals or kids of high net worth individuals who are used to being around a yacht or used to talking about um, you know, birthday parties in the hundreds of thousands end up in a sales role. Most salespeople, myself included, from a working class family. And so there are limits that are set in us by our parents, society, that we need to break through. And, and those limits will, if you are uncomfortable talking about a $3 million deal size, you're never going to get, you, you will you will end up in having conversations with people at the deal size that you're comfortable talking about. So you're mm-hmm. going to be pushed down the food chain. You're not going to progress a deal. You're not going to get to the executive level to push these across the line, even though you want to do it because of your own psychology. That was a, that was an important one as well. And again, it's one of those that you you highlight. It's highlighted, and it becomes you know it's really obvious um, when you try and uh, then build strategy around it to improve people mi- improve people's mindsets on these things. Okay, so we got assertiveness. And we got comfort, and then we got habits, right? What what are any other ones that bubbled at the top that make you think like like you know definitely fall in the the top performer bucket? Yep. So uh, being an optimist, obviously, if you're pessimistic about picking up the phone and the person on the other end of it uh, having a nice conversation with you, you're never going to pick up the phone. And uh, not being a people pleaser, which is not dissimilar too dissimilar from being assertive. So people pleasers will give, 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 and not communicate what they want in exchange. And so they'll end up frustrated after all the giving because they don't get what they want. Um, Buyers want to work with people who can offer direct value back to them and will overtly communicate it. They don't want to be in a situation where they're guessing at what you're after. So not being a people pleaser, high levels of self-esteem, high levels of personal accountability, the ability to set goals. They're the kind of things that we're talking about. Yeah, that makes sense. Anything else before we move on from the the survey? Because that's such a large sample size that that like you saw that was mind blowing or surprised you, if you will. And then anything else that was super critical? Um, one thing that was hard to define, I call it the caveman brain, is perhaps didn't blow my mind, but I thought it was really interesting. And this leads to a conversation about procrastination, habits, and, and other things as well. But the ability to essentially control your emotions and do the damn job, even when you don't want to do the job. So I call it the caveman brain. If you've got the computer brain, inputs come in, habits get shot out. If you can't compute the task, then it goes to the, the emotional the caveman brain, which can only club people over the head or run away. That's essentially all it can do. And you've got to get the task from there to your logical human brain before you can actually take um, you know, sophisticated action upon it. So that was interesting. There's a lot more to that. And we could talk about it for the next 15 hours, if you like. Um, but that, that's the part of the process that is the most difficult to describe. But when people get it and they start finding themselves day to day, living in their caveman brain, just plodding along, being emotional at things that they don't really don't care about. You know, you're driving along, you have a near miss, you stick your fingers up and you start screaming at the person you're not consciously thinking about the fact that, hey, this person might get out of the car. They might have a weapon. They might just come and beat, beat the shit out of me. Th- those kind of things are you know, just bypassed by the, the, the caveman brain. Once people start recognizing that day-to-day, they become a lot more logical and they tend to get a lot more of the important stuff done. Okay. I love that you called that out because it's funny. I had to overcome that personally. And so I had to overcome that as a rep. And then recently had to overcome that as a founder because there's like just a wider dispersion of different things that I could focus on everything from marketing to product to sales to 
leading a team, right? And so mm-hmm. here's here's my two that I use because this I think will be helpful for for you, the listener, because. And I'll tell you one example where it came up was prospecting, right? I remember when my earlier days and I had a prospect and I had a call, I was calling on CIOs and CTOs of like investment banks and brokerages. So I had to call up like the CTO of Merrill Lynch and try and sell them um, basically a training package and a one call close or with a sales cycle of at least, you know, of less than 24 hours for a deal size of 4,000 to 20,000, right? If I did a really good job, have them give them give me their credit card over the phone before they even saw anything. So that was like the goal and the outcome. So like I had to have my shit together. Right. And like I had to make two two hundred fifty dollars a day. But I would remember like one of the things that was a barrier, not necessarily with that job, because I think it was so like tight with what I had to do. I couldn't really deviate and think a lot is when I shifted to outside sales and I had to do kind of the same thing. But what I noticed myself starting to do and this is a symptom. So if you're doing this, definitely be careful. I was over preparing. So I was like perfectionist preparing. So I'm like, all right, I'm gonna call this person. Uh, do I know everything about the company? Doing everything about this? Do I know everything about that? And I, I over prepared so much that now granted, when I talk to people, I nailed it, right? But the problem of why I did that is because my caveman brain, if you will, like, like, like you mentioned, Will, was telling me like, you're not ready. You're not ready. You're not ready. You're, you're not, you're not going to be have it dialed in. And so I had to step back and I'm being like, why do I need to prepare 20 minutes for every freaking cold call that I make? And I kind of like came to this, this understanding. It's like the reason why is because I was afraid to mess up. Right. And that was like the core element. So once I understood that, I put in a system in place so that I didn't go through that and, 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 you know, do that. So that's step one. The other one is, um, so that helped me overcome it. Just like logically deconstructing why I was doing something that like I, I shouldn't have been doing. The second one, and this is something that I literally have been working on. Um, I, I'm into biohacking and understanding like personal development. And this one was really around like, uh, there were some goals that I had uh, that I wanted to get done that were critical for the business that I wasn't doing. And so I'm like, I did some deep work on it. It was over the weekend. And I understood that like my reasons for doing those, A, weren't clear and B, weren't significant enough for me to like focus on that versus everything else. So I kept putting it to the bottom of the pile. Right. So that's the second. I don't know if you've had anything like that as well, but those are like two things that come like top of mind as you're talking about this. Yeah. So I used to be a massive procrastinator. I used to, unless the deadline was three minutes from that moment, this moment in time, yep. I wouldn't Did have started any, I wouldn't have started any project. I got over that by understanding this concept of the, the emotional, the K-bomb part of my brain. And this is so crazy, right? I literally beat that by just making lists. And the logical side of my brain, the human side takes over so much that then I see a list. And I'm like, I've got to complete the list. I've oh, got okay. it's, it's got to be done. And cool. I'm not OCD or, or anything like that. But I get so, and I know it sounds crazy saying it out loud, right? Maybe I shouldn't be saying this out loud. Maybe should, this should be my inside voice saying this, uh, not on a, pop, on a podcast. But I get so much pleasure from ticking the damn box that I draw next to the task on you know whatever it is. Email this person, follow up on this, you know, create this piece of content. I get such a dopamine, uh, you know, the dopamine and serotonin kind of cycle on the back of that. that It's almost addictive, which is why I don't gamble or anything. Because I think I I think I could get addicted to lots of like uh, uh, not non-valuable things pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, But, you know, it's my competitive nature in that as well. And I'll see this list and I'll be like, well, I'll just I'll just hustle for another hour and get it done. But if it's not on the list, it's floating around in my brain and I get this emotional caveman-esque um, pressure that I put on myself. I'm like, oh, and I, I feel overwhelmed. But as soon as I write it down, it's done. It's, 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 it's almost like a feedback loop via your kind of your eyes, your ocular system of, oh, it's on the page. I, my brain, do, the brain goes, I don't need to remind this idiot of it anymore. It's going to get done. And so just that one thing alone of making a list every morning, obviously I don't get through it every day, but then the things that I miss, I write down on the next day. And if it's been two or three days and I've still not got to it, then I probably don't need to do it. I just cross it off. That's that's mm. literally my process to be, you know, humbly a you know, pretty productive guy. Okay. Yeah, I love that, man. All right. Well, let's switch gears a little bit. I do want to talk a little bit about AI as I do with all my guests uh, because I've been obsessed with some of the results that I'm seeing for sales and go to market teams and personally as well. So one of the things that you mentioned is like the biggest barrier for prospecting I, I see is the biggest adoption 
challenge or hurdle for folks, and it doesn't need to be within sales only, it could be marketing, it could be leaders, is literally habits, right? Like I'm just not used to doing that habit. And so some of the leading indicators I'm seeing are folks that are like, well, I tried it and I didn't get a good result, or I'm not used to doing it. So I think it's gonna take more time than it would for me to actually do the thing, right? Like those are kind of like areas. However, like key success leading indicators I'm seeing are people that are willing to experiment, people that also are curious naturally, that's like a good leading indicator. And the funny thing is the people that are elevating themselves organizationally aren't always the top performers, right? Sometimes it's the middle people that have those traits. What are you seeing in terms of adoption across the sales folks that you work with or the companies and organizations that you work with? And I would love to hear your perspective on that. So two things here. AI, I'll get to in a second. Your previous point of not doing the work or realizing it's going to be more difficult than what they thought it would be, that is typically solved when people really understand the scientific method of make, mm -hmm. documenting a hypothesis, documenting your steps to prove or disprove it, and then using that as a feedback loop to move forward. Most, not most, that's, that's unfair. A lot of people don't understand that process. It's obviously that simple. People understand it when you communicate it like that. Most people don't implement it. So if you want to introduce a new marketing activity, the goal is this much attention. That's no good. It's got to be something that's measurable. It's got to be something that's achievable within a certain period of time. And then when you outline the tasks to get there, you either get there or you don't. And then you've got a feedback loop to understand, do I want to spend more time narrowing the focus because we were close? Or do we want to just get rid of this altogether because it was absolutely way off? So that's how I coach people through that process that you were talking about a second ago of when the, you know, the grass is always greener. People are faffing around with one thing mm -hmm. and another. And sometimes it just takes a year to have a good sales or marketing result doing something that's difficult until you work it out and get it right. Hopefully it takes three three days. Sometimes, especially like content marketing and things like that, right? You know, with your no. podcast, it starts to snowball. You get more and more eyeballs over time and it becomes more and more worth it. The, the juice is more and more worth the squeeze. As for AI, I think you've got to be kind of careful with this of, are you trying to go broad or are you trying to go narrow? I've seen lots of salespeople in my training program have success going slightly broader, but I've seen a lot of salespeople that are wasting a lot of time using AI tools when they could just write the damn email themselves. They could just mm -hmm. pick up the phone. Now, if you're doing a large complex deal and you're not um, kind of in the mid market or trying to like spray and pray a little bit, just doing the basics effectively is still enough. You can try and optimize, but most people are better off trying to close bigger deals or trigger deal cycle lengths rather than overcomplicating the process itself by trying to scale a, a person of one to a person of many. But then as you start to get into other areas, obviously AI massively speeds up that process. Um, and for doing, you know, understanding who's on your website or retargeting content, all that kind of thing, AI is really special and it's, it's becoming more and more interesting over time. Yeah. Yeah. And well, and here's kind of the way I look at it too, man. I look at it as not, when I say AI, I mean like ChatGPT or Copilot, tools that non-technical folks can use relatively easy for day-to-day -day work, mm -hmm. right? Specifically on the go-to-market sure. side. And like one of the things that that I think, and this is like the simplest thing. Actually, there's a couple of thoughts I have brewing around in my head, but like one is like the most common use cases everybody looks at first are email. And I think that's like, one of the biggest misnomers of like, all right, can I use it for email? Can I use it for presentations? Can I use it for research? And there's some amazing use cases there, right? However, what, what I see the biggest opportunity in is something that actually hit me over the head like a sledgehammer the first time I tested it based on my knowledge. And, and what I mean by that, this was like GPT 3.5, right when it was released. And this was in like 22 of November. I'm like, there were, there's all these things going around on LinkedIn about like, oh, let's see if it could replaced me. Um, and then people are testing it like off of what they knew. Well, I tested that off of like 10,000 hours of vertical expertise or enterprise sales expertise. And then looking into how the decision makers were compensated, evaluated and, and how they work. Right. I'm like, all right, I'm going to ask this shit. I'm going to ask this freaking tool. Like, can if it could do this and it got like 90% of the way there in like two or three questions. All right. So yeah. Thinking, like scaling thinking, whether it be for a role, a function, or an individual is something that many miss. And so that's one of the things I think is a huge opportunity, 
The other, and this is like, let's get into the email example that everybody uses, right? One of the simplest use cases for this is you have a prospecting email, you have two paragraphs and two sentences are customized of that email and they're changed based on high, high value targets that you have. The simplest way that you could do is say, okay, I want you to rewrite this email and then you paste it in there, but make it relevant to this or make it more focused on this or, and that's all you got to do and it'll rewrite the entire email for you, but it'll have that focus on what you're connecting with that person on. So like, that's a super simple one. What's your favorite use case? Well, I would love to hear what you use it for favorite use cases you've seen as well. I have not been that bothered about it. Okay. Not believed in the hype, not used it all that much until the other day. So I'm part of this YouTube mastermind and one of them suggested, hey, if you want to do some shorts, why not do some shorts just answering questions from salespeople, right? Now, on my email newsletter, the first email that goes out is, hey, respond to this email with your biggest problem in sales. And, you know, if I've got time, I'll, I'll get back to you with some kind of feedback. The I'll get, get, back, get back to as many people as I can, but obviously it's, it's overwhelming at a certain point. But I've got a folder on my computer with 30,000 emails from people with all their problems. So I was going to go through all those emails like a dummy and copy and paste them or do like some kind of tally chart. I was like, right, can I just try OpenAI's tool and just ask, give me 150 questions that B2B salespeople solving complex, doing complex sales, what they have. And it was perfect. And so all of my shorts content for the past six months has been based on the back of that. So then, or nuanced, med medical device salespeople in this region with this product, what questions do they have? So that gives me the, the framework to work upon. and. I think you, you, you touched on, you probably agree, you touched on the point there of you don't, unless you are an expert in your space, you don't have the expertise to know whether this, what it's spitting out is good or bad. But I found since then, I've been using it to speed up the process of giving the, um, not necessarily the structure, but like, for example, with a, with a YouTube video, what are the four things that salespeople struggle with right now? Mm -hmm. Four of them. Maybe two of them, three of them are good. So I'll tell it to get rid of those two and have another go. But you still need the expertise on the other end of, at the moment, anyway. Before it, before you, chat GDP 17 is just going to wipe out everyone. But as, we, as we're still holding on for, for dear life in our roles, that level of expertise, it just allows me to speed up the process. I haven't found it to be revolutionary, um, but someone who's perhaps less experienced, less experienced, they, they might get to decent quality. Um, with three clicks, as opposed to, you know, to do it on your own, it might take you three years. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that use case. I think that's awesome. Like you could leverage the same thing with sales transcripts at scale. So you can, you could pull out the language of like the phrases that your buyers use versus the phrases that your non-buyers use, right. To, to tell the difference, incorporate that into marketing copy, and then also create that, use that for product development as well. So that was like, one of the things I was playing with the other day, but I love that use case for the short. So what were the net results? Like, have you seen, because you've been using that with answering questions for shorts, is that, have you seen a big uptake in terms of like basically views or engagement or anything like that? Views and engagement, yes, but not because of the quality of the questions, more so they would have took me a week to write the questions. So I probably um, wouldn't have done it. And so I wouldn't have produced as much content as what I had done on the back of that. So it okay. was a great tool for here's a load of stuff, go and record some shorts, as opposed to um, the quality of those questions are better than what I could do if I sat there. But, you know, I, I don't have the time to sit there. That, that's yeah. a, you know, a brute force task that it, that it was absolutely perfect to help me with. Love that, man. All right. Well, unfortunately, Will, we are up on time. Uh, if you did not listen to episode one, we get deep into a lot of areas specifically around heck man what, what the hell did we talk about the first episode it feels like it was a, a decade ago right but what, what did we give you cover on the first one i'm having brain farts we got into uh prospecting and all kind of attention and prospecting man it was one of those days where i woke up early so i'm a little bit off today i apologize where can people find you where can they find more about you man and then we'll wrap things up um, head over to salesman.com. My two books are there. I'm constantly updated. I've just added a, a whole um, chapter on um, on um, business cases. So they're constantly getting updated. That is absolutely everything I know about sales. Um, so if you just want to improve your sales skills, if you want to become the person who's capable of implementing those skills, 
by implementing the 18 habits and traits of high performers. Grab those two books. If you ever want help implementing whatever you learn in the books, that's where my training comes in. So you find it all over at salesman.com. Excellent, man. Well, thanks for being on. It was a pleasure having you on for part two and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Cheers, Ryan. I appreciate it, mate.